Here at the United Nations, we have had a healthy debate about countering violent extremism, and more recently, this debate has evolved to include prevention, that is, the path and strategy to preventing violent extremism, which is not born from a vacuum, but from an exclusive and intolerant ideology. As a performer, singer, songwriter, a Muslim living in the West, I'm not immune to the harms of extremist ideology as promoted by dominant Muslim institutions in the United States. The curtailing of the right to express oneself, of the right to think, read, speak freely. This authoritarianism, this tyranny of thought, is the foundation from which intolerance, single-mindedness is created in a society that is the path toward extremism. It is this personal journey that resulted in me creating progressive Muslim community in Los Angeles, one that celebrated diversity, culture, and the creation of new cultures. Meanwhile, Muslim extremists in the West have created a counterculture that ridicules the space that enables them to create that counterculture in the first place. Throughout this panel, you will see examples of culture, one that makes life worth living, for dying for, culture that promotes dignity, diversity, culture that defends life in the form of the arts, be it in protest songs, dance, poetry. There is a war. It is a war against the culture of life and the culture of death. With that, I would like to introduce you to Special Rapporteur Karima Banun. Besides being the special rapporteur in the field of cultural rights, as an author, she is also the winner of the Dayton Light Literary Peace Prize for Nonfiction for her book, Your Fatwa Does Not Apply Here, and, and was also selected as the best social science book of 2013 by the American Library Association's book list. Her first TED, TED Talk, based on the book, When People of Muslim Heritage Confront Fundamentalism, has garnered over 1.3 million views. She is a professor of international law at the University of California, Davis School of Law, and an advisory board member of Muslims for Progressive Values. Professor Karima grew up in Algeria and the United States and now lives in North California. Karima Benou. Thank you very much, Ani. And thank you all for being here uh, on this Friday morning after what I know has been a very long week. And I would like to particularly thank the co-sponsors of this event, uh, Free Muse, Muslims for Progressive Values, uh, AWID, and the Center for Inquiry. And I'd like to thank all of those who worked on putting this event together, uh, including Joanne Bouchard, my colleague uh, here at OHCHR, including our volunteers, uh, Rebecca Allen, as well as my students who are here, Rima Pangarkar and Julie King. Uh, so I'm really hoping that we can have a discussion about this report, what it means, what it means for people uh, doing work in this area, and how we might come together to begin to implement some of the most critical recommendations. And I thought what I would do this morning is talk about a few key points emerging from the report and a few of what I see as the priority recommendations. And then I'm really eager to turn over to the wonderful panel that we have for you today. Because unfortunately, these are not the voices that you hear often enough in United Nations fora. And we really have to change that. Uh, so without further ado, let me just give a brief introduction to the report on fundamentalism, extremism, and cultural rights, uh, which is a report I'll be presenting in an interactive dialogue later today uh, at 1245 to the Human Rights Council, and I hope some of you will join us uh, for that debate as well. So I wrote this report because for years I had watched people on the front lines of challenging fundamentalism, people who were putting their lives on the line to stand up to a range of fundamentalist and extremist movements, often using culture and working in the fields of culture, whether it was theater directors uh, who were having their festivals uh, blown up, threatened, and then actually blown up and having to decide whether or not to continue, 
uh, whether it was uh, those who run cultural spaces in very difficult places and still manage to bring people together in innovative ways for all sorts of cultural programming, uh, to create new venues, for example, for people from opposite sides of conflicts to take part together in deb debates via Skype and so on. Uh, whether it was to see people who were working to curate museums that were being attacked in some cases uh, by fundamentalists and extremists and were in some cases again putting their lives on the line to protect those cultural heritage collections for all of humanity. And whether it was women's human rights defenders all around the world, in all regions of the world, taking up the challenge of confronting fundamentalism and extremism when the world very often was not listening to them, not listening to their warnings about the seriousness of the problem. Uh, and in fact, if you look at scholarship in this area, uh, there's a very important book in the field of international law called The Boundaries of International Law. And the feminist international lawyers who wrote it, Hillary Charlesworth and Christine Chinkin, warned already back in 2000 that what they called religious extremism uh, was one of the two leading threats to women's human rights worldwide. So what I really felt is that in fact we can't move forward in the critical area of cultural rights. We can't move forward with guaranteeing enjoyment of the right to take part in cultural life without discrimination for everyone. We can't move forward with regard to the right to freedom of artistic expression and scientific freedom and education and freedom of religion. All the things that are either at the core of my mandate uh, or related to my mandate. We can't move forward on any of these issues if we do not confront the challenge we are facing today from diverse fundamentalism and extremism in every region of the world and in many different forms. And I really want to stress, I am looking at many different forms of fundamentalism and extremism in the report. And I say very clearly that fundamentalism should never be associated only with one religion, nor should fundamentalist views be imputed to all of the members of any religion. In fact, for the most part, when we look at religious fundamentalisms, we are looking at minority uh, phenomena that are being challenged by uh, the rest of those religious traditions. Uh, so if we don't confront uh, these issues, we can't move forward. That was a, a critical point for me to raise in the report. Another is that cultural rights are key to the response to fundamentalism. These are not luxury items. Education is crucial. Having artistic space uh, for people to meet and express themselves and rethink and dissent is so important uh, to being able to have the kind of conversations uh, that we need. And I really felt that the cultural rights mandate then was a critical place to take up this issue of fundamentalism and extremism. Uh, so another point that I make in the report before my time is up that I wanted to mention. And I want to mention it because it is perhaps different than some of the human rights approaches that you may hear. Critical point in the report is that ideology and fundamentalist and extremist ideology, and I explore the definitions in detail in the report, you can look at that. Um, I'm not going to do that here, but we can do it in the Q&A. But fundamentalist and extremist ideologies in their diverse forms themselves pose challenges to human rights. Uh, they challenge uh, the right to take part in cultural life without discrimination. Now certainly they also produce human rights abuses, human rights violations across the range of my mandate, and sometimes they also lead to overt forms of violence. Uh, and those things the international community has largely focused on. But what I'm saying here is that we also have to have a human rights response to the ideologies that are giving rise to these violations and this violence. And let me be very clear, I'm not talking for a moment about criminalizing ideas. What I'm talking about is confronting those ideas with alternatives, with education that is in accordance with international standards, for example, uh, with voices that are able to express themselves freely in civil society and in the arts that challenge those narratives. That is absolutely critical. Uh, so let me end by saying I do really believe we're facing, as this side event was called, a global avalanche of hate. And we all watch the news. We have seen it. Hate in many different forms. And the ideology of hate, which in some cases is being normalized and even being taken up by mainstream political parties. We have no choice but to respond. These are human rights issues. And we need a human rights response, which is both effective 
and absolutely is carried out in accordance with international standards. There is absolutely no basis on which to justify violations of human rights uh, because of the call for an effective challenge to fundamentalism. And I want to be absolutely clear uh, about that. But let me end with one single idea. I have my students here, they're very young. There are many people in the world who can't be students. And I look at those young people and I wonder what the future holds for them. Will they have access to the culture and the diversity and the mixing of people that we have had? We have to do everything that we can collectively to make sure that we leave youth with more than a bleak choice of competing extremisms in the world. And I think cultural rights can play a key role in that process. Thank you so much, and I very much look forward to hearing from all of you. Our next speaker is uh, Chaitan Bhatt, a professor and director of the Center for the Study of Human Rights at the London School of Economics and Political Science. He has worked and published extensively on both far-right and violent religious right movements, including their networks in Europe and South Asia. Chaitan. Thank you, and thank you very much for inviting me here to speak at this event that coincides with the very important and indeed much needed report of Professor Karima Banun to the UN Human Rights Council. Her report addresses central issues of our time in terms of the dramatic rise and proliferation of both religious fundamentalist and far-right xenophobic movements and the multiple threats that they pose to cultural rights to human rights and to many fundamental freedoms. Now culture and contestations about culture are central to human rights in ways that are often missed. And here I don't mean our usual discussions about cultural identity or cultural relativism that we often encounter. I instead mean the entire field of cultural life, of cultural being, of cultural movement, flux, diversity, mixing and openness that today's demagogues see as a threat, something to be abhorred or defeated. Consider the far-right Hindutva movement now holding political power in India. It was inspired in the 1920s and the 1930s by Mussolini and by Hitler, and it is this movement that murdered Mohandas K. Gandhi. And this movement from its inception, like many other fundamentalist and xenophobic movements, focuses on culture, the cultural molding of a new, in this case, Hindu man, as part of a violent supremacist agenda that cannot tolerate other ways of being, other cultural and social ways of being, open, unfixed, impure ways of being that aren't driven by nationalist or religious political goals. And it's not a surprise then that this movement attacks with a shrill ferocity artists whose paintings they destroy, humanist bloggers who are killed, writers who are attacked, or whose books are called to be banned. Journalists are similarly threatened, and cultural representations that the movement dislikes, whether these be through film, theater, art, music, or books, are attacked or are banned. And it focuses very densely, like most far-right movements do, on educational institutions, from primary schools to universities, from science and management schools to institutes of historical research that it wants to bring under the charge of its activists and bring closer to its extreme anti-minority, caste-based supremacist ideology. Educational textbooks for school children that present complex history and not simple chauvinism are rewritten to extol Hindu supremacy. And science, against which it marshals its own gigantic fabrications, science is mutilated because it cannot serve the agenda of these fundamentalists. Genuine intellectual, literary, and artistic freedoms are threats to this movement, and hence the repeated attempts to curtail them. Real history and living cultural diversity are enemies, hence the numerous projects of the far right to rewrite history into chauvinistic stories of empires and glory, much like the Islamists do. The Hindutva movement even attacks expressions of love, including on Valentine's Day every year, the movement here exactly copying what the Salafi jihadis, the political Islamists, and the Christian fundamentalists also do. And this widespread attack on the events, the monuments, the festivals, the institutions of culture is deliberate. Like other fundamentalists, the Hindutva movement wants to change the entire political and social culture in order to create a supremacist, anti-minority, caste-based order. 
Universal ideas of equality have no place here. Natural hierarchy and natural orders are supposed to displace them. And the far right wants to, want to substitute the lived cultures of humanity with crass fictions of enmity and hatred or loyalty or natural hierarchy and natural supremacy. And this is precisely what the newly energized, viciously xenophobic movements in the United States and Europe also want to do. Whatever new names they conjure to sanitize themselves, those movements are neo-Nazi or fascistic in much of their ideological thinking. Their ideas come typically from revolutionary conservatism that existed in the interwar period and was close to both Nazism and Italian fascism. And the influences from the past that are important today include beliefs in a natural racial hierarchy, a natural elitism, a natural social order under their control. And like the Hindutva movement, the neo-Nazis, for them, hatred is legitimate in politics. Incitement to hatred is a legitimate form of politics. And their targets are very similar. Now, internationally, we've seen a frightening pattern of authoritarian xenophobic figures emerging as prominent political figures in movements or as leaders in several formal democracies or semi-democracies. Russia, Turkey, India, Israel, the United States, France, Britain, Hungary, the Philippines, among them. And their rise reflects new political styles and habits, a cruel populism, a world beyond truth, nativism, illiberalism, an aversion to democratic accountability, and often the undermining of independent democratic institutions and elements of the rule of law, and a sustained attack on human rights and human rights NGOs. In the United States today, we see a return of what used to be called the culture wars. Now, in addition to racism and anti-Muslim hatred, there is a reason why the American far right, with Mr. Donald Trump at its helm, attack the media as fake news, deny legitimate science, want to undermine education, the universities, and the liberal arts, attack neutral public administration, attack courts and judges, and reject the complex, open forms of knowledge that emerge, for example, around climate science, from science, the humanities, and so on. And these latter institutions and ideas are all in their different ways, forces for democratic accountability, and at their very best, they can be reflective of an open-ended culture. And the attack on the so-called metropolitan elite by even bigger rapacious elites is also an attack on a certain culture of liberal democratic accountability. And we must recognize that, even if we are to oppose elitism in politics. Now, if the ideals of diversity, equality, and universalism are under a severe attack, so is basic truth, and veracity, and intellectual freedom, and reason, and science. And these are all assaults on cultural rights. And it seems for the human rights movement, defense of the latter have to be key elements of their work over this coming period. In such work, we cannot any longer assume a centrist consensus around human rights. A democratic centrist consensus regarding international human rights might have existed in earlier decades, but now, in many parts of the West, it appears no longer to exist or is under serious threat, replaced as it is by sharp polarization. In opposing the vicious, sustained attacks that we see on Muslim populations and on other minorities in the West, we also cannot compromise basic principles of equality and anti-discrimination by joining with the religious far right against the racist far right. Similarly, we cannot oppose violent religious forces by aligning with just the ordinarily hateful and discriminatory religious forces. There are many challenges for cultural rights here. Cultures are always fields of contestation and ones now in which one key area of challenge is between those who see culture as an exclusive property to which they're the sole inheritors and guardians, who turn culture into a prison, an enclave of the past that has to be defended with all kinds of violence. And against them are those for whom cultures are open fields of endeavor and potential, of the future in which humanity realizes its possibilities as diversities, diversities of knowledge, of arts, of sciences, histories, beliefs, and people. Thank you. Thank you, Chaitan. A lot to digest. Um, our next speaker is Alejandra Sarda Chandri Ramani.
a Latin American feminist and sexual rights activist who is completing her PhD in human rights at Universidad de la Plata, Argentina, and working as interim director of programs for AWID, the Association for Women's Rights and Development. Thank you. I was so fascinated with the previous speaker that I forgot to put my computer on. I, I am honored to be here and to be part of Karima's report that really is extremely useful and important for us working in, in this field. In the Latin, I, I will take some of the issues in her report and I will focus them in the Latin American context, my context. Uh, here the fundamentalist expressions are mainly Christian, both Catholic and Evangelical. The Catholic Church has a long history of violent power in our region, beginning with their part in the destruction of indigenous cultures during colonization to today, when despite progressive proclamations by Pope Francis, things have in many ways got worse, especially in areas of diversity and concerning sexual and reproductive rights. The first issue I will address is the stifling freedom of artistic expression as a manifestation of a fundamentalist abuse of cultural rights. And we have an image for this. This is the work of Anna Smile, a Brazilian artist. Last year, she was sued by the Catholic Church, had to pay a fine, and saw her work erased from social media and also physically removed from an art gallery. The church alleged that their right to personal dignity, honor, and privacy had been violated and the judge agreed. In Latin America, religious fundamentalist actors often make use of existing laws and protections. In other cases, they have used anti-discrimination laws. And they use this to curtail the rights of others to cultural expression, sometimes with the complicity of state power. In this example, the church based its arguments on a claim to hold individual rights, which do not in fact apply to institutions, but are actually intended to protect individuals from powerful institutions, just like the Catholic Church. In a region like ours, with a long history of violent and repressive dictatorships, unless states show a strong response to these attempts, it is easy for those under attack to feel helpless, and they might resort to self-censorship to the detriment of the cultural democracies that this special rapporteur talks about. My second issue is uh, the attacks against education as a milieu in which cultural values are built and transmitted and challenged. And we will now move to Colombia. I will tell you a story. Sergio Urrego was 16. He was studying at a Catholic school. He committed suicide after being harassed by the school authorities for being gay. Sergio's parents sued the school. The case reached the Colombian Constitutional Court that in 2015 ordered the Ministry of Education to review all school regulations in the country to make sure they respected students' sexual orientation and gender identity encourage a culture of coexistence and allow respect for diversity. The ministry complied. Catholic and evangelical religious fundamentalist groups responded with a misinformation campaign, and we have an image for this, accusing the ministry to be, this is what they were distributing, what they were saying that the ministry was distributing. This, in fact, is taken from a Belgian cartoon and the ministry had never distributed this. And they accusing the ministry of being promoting homosexuality and the gender ideology in schools. The, the campaign drew thousands of signatures, public demonstrations, was so violent and so successful that it ended with the minister submitting her resignation. Here we see how religious fundamentalist groups stopped a state from fulfilling its international obligations to enforce non-discrimination in schools and to educate about the value of cultural diversity. And the state was committed to do this. This is what is even more sad. Fundamentalism kills also indirectly. For instance, when it blocks the passing of laws that save lives, 
Think safe abortion, think HIV prevention. Also, it might not pull the trigger or throw the acid, but it can make a teenager feel unworthy to keep on living because of who he or she is. Also, like the special rapporteur say in her report, it is a major obstacle to achieving the NDG. Oh, there was no inclusive and quality education for Sergio. On a positive note, some positive developments in my region. Uh, we have two countries, Cuba and Costa Rica, who are above the UNESCO recommended government expenditure in culture, which is 1% of the total budget. Some Latin American states constitutionally define themselves as multi-ethnic and what we call pluricultural, many cultures, like Bolivia, Ecuador, or Mexico. And Venezuela does it in its public policies. Bolivia has a very interesting thing, a ministry of cultures, which is very important in our region, where particularly indigenous cultures have been so repressed. This, that the government takes this instance is a very important protection for cultural diversity and against the claim that there is one culture. The special, rapporteurs, the special rapporteur underlines the key contribution of women who are confronting this avalanche of hatred around the world and who often are the target of smear campaigns attacking their morality or their sexuality in an attempt to silence their voices. I want to end by honoring some of them. First, Yvonne Guevara. She is a Brazilian Catholic nun and feminist, much punished by her church, who recently wrote, in this historical moment, we will continue to wave together one more part of this vast history of the affirmation of freedom, the right to be different and to think differently. And we will continue not being afraid to be happy. I dare to say that being happy even under misfortune is a common feature of Latin American cultures. A great example of this are the Catholicas por el Derecho a Decidir, a fighting network of activists that never tire to proclaim their right to be Catholics, feminists, and sexual rights advocates. And they do it with humor, as you will see in the video that I will watch now, I will show now, and that is also mentioned in the special report report is from this, their series called Catolicadas. I leave you in the best of company. Qué bonito cantan. Parecen jilguerillos. Has hecho un magnífico trabajo con el coro, Sor Juana. Seguro vamos a ganar el festival de Yotutepec. Ganar es lo de menos, Padre Beto. El verdadero premio... Juanita, cuidado con el si bemol. El verdadero premio es ir a cantar, Padre Beto. Vamos a ganar el festival de Yotutepec. ¡Ah, oh, Chihuahua! ¿Qué está pasando, Richie? Mejor me orillo y lo averiguo. ¿Qué tiene? Tiene muchas piezas. ¡Dios mío! ¡Padre Beto! Aquí abajo hay una laguna. ¿Quiere venir? Quiero que se arregle esta maldita cosa. ¡Ay! ¡Ah! ¡Ah! ¡Camioneta del demonio! ¡Vamos, niños! El Padre Beto no está de humor. ¡Funciona! ¡Ay, madre mía! ¿Qué pasa aquí? ¡Padre Beto! A los niños se les antojaba tanto bañarse y no les pude decir que no. ¡Pero, Sor Juana, están en calzones! ¿Y eso qué tiene de malo? ¡Se les ven las pompas! ¿Cómo se te ocurre permitirle esta mañana con cupiscencia? No haga que los niños se avergüencen de su cuerpo, Padre Beto. ¡El cuerpo es templo de Dios! No se puede andar enseñándolo así como así. Incita a malos pensamientos. El que tiene malos pensamientos es usted, Padre Beto. Estos niños en nada ofenden a Dios. ¡Esto se acabó! ¡Niños, fuera del agua inmediatamente! ¡Padre Beto! ¡Deje que nos mojemos un ratito más! ¡El coro de la parroquia de San Pablo no se moja! ¡El coro de la parroquia se va a hacer oír, Padre Beto! El cuerpo no está en oposición al espíritu. Ambos son creación de Dios. El que desprecia al cuerpo también desprecia a su creador. Dios nos regaló el cuerpo con todas sus sensaciones, no para negarlo, sino para vivirlo. 
Disfrutar no es pecado. Entonces, ¿qué dice Padre Beto? ¡Impúdicos! ¡A vestirse! ¡Ahora! Usted se arrepentirá de esto, Padre Beto. ¡Jamás! ¡A la camioneta! mi barca junto a ti Ya averiguaré yo quién fue el gracioso Lo que está claro es quién fue el tramposo <risa> Acelera, Richie That's a nice break of uh, humor for a rather depressing uh, subject matter um, The common denominator that we see here in the context of Latin America and the, the ch Catholic Church uh, in its uh, domination and dictation of what culture should and should not be is similar uh, in, in the scope of the domination of some of uh, the more conservative strand of Islam that claims to represent uh, all Muslims of the world. Uh, so it's interesting how they all play, play each other's games. Um, our next speaker is uh, Samia Ben Khairoubi. Uh, she was born in Bilda, Al Bilda Blida, Algeria. She studied journalism at the University of Alger and a presenter on Algeria's TV network until a terrorist attack put a stop to it. That was in 1994. Uh, we're still experiencing these uh, terrorist attacks. Since then, Samia has been working in France in a series of shows on Algeria for Art, the Geopolis Algeria special with Claude Cerulean from France 2, and the Arab Med Mediterranean Press Review on TV5. She produced a documentary titled L'Ecole au Couvre de la Vie, School of the Heart of Life, intended for newly arrived members of the Arab Maghreb community and a series of documentaries on women's rights and their struggles in different countries in Africa. Samia currently works with Mediterranean Women's Fund. With that, I pass it on to you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank my friend Karima Benoun to invite me. Uh, Karima, Karima Benoun, which is uh, doing for uh, years a very good work about what, uh, what we were living uh, with the fundamentalist. Uh, I have uh, bring with this book with me because it's very important. Your fatwa does not apply here. She has met uh, 300 people from 30 uh, countries around the world, people who were resisting to fundamentalists and to extremists. And uh, that's why uh, her report is very important and we really should uh, to read it and to, uh, to, uh, to take the recommendation seriously because uh, uh, we are living a very bizarre uh, period. I am Algerian and uh, uh, I, in 1988 I was 20. I lived in my country. I was student in journalism and uh, we have our uh, Arab Spring, you know, but it was like uh, a week low, uh, closed because we didn't have a social media at this time. And uh, we, before we had one uh, political party and then we, we had uh, a multipartism, we had a, a freedom of speech, we had, uh, and I have the chance to work uh, on the national television, the unique, the one uh, national television with a musical program. Uh, I was still a student and we, uh, this program were, 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 was very successful. Uh, it was seen uh, by, uh, uh, by uh, all the generation, by all the region, by uh, children, by uh, older, by, and it was very um, uh, rassembleur. Yeah, I brought people together uh, in the same family. And in uh, 90, we had uh, elections, um, local elections, and the Islamist party won. And then we began, because Islamists, after the revolution, like in Tunisia or uh, Libya or uh, Egypt, uh, came and they, uh, uh, you know, they... Um, they profited of the breach. 
they, yeah, they took advantage from democracy to uh, to uh, to impose their uh, vision and to impose their uh, their uh, way of life. But we we continue to work uh, uh, because uh, the, the, we we really liked it. It was successful, so we continue to to have this program uh, till um, even if. Uh, um, uh, since uh, in '92, we began to have uh, uh, assassination, assassination for uh, policemen, for uh, military, for uh, intellectual, for journalists, for writers, for singers, for people, for women, for uh, uh, villages, uh, entire villages, and we continue to work because uh, this is our way to to say uh, that we are living. Life is stronger than uh, than uh, death. And in fourteenth uh, of uh, February uh, nineteen ninety four, uh, Valentine's Day. We didn't know <laughs> that is Valentine's Day at this uh, period. Uh, the producer of uh, the program. Um, was uh, was uh, shot by uh, five uh, bulbs. He didn't die. He didn't die. It's very rare that uh, when they uh, they target someone, they kill it. They kill him, and he didn't die by chance. But he is uh, uh, still uh, today in the wheelchair. Um, he didn't stop to work. He, you know, we stopped to think. We stopped to uh, everything at this time uh, after February uh, '94, and uh, because we stopped our work, uh, Aziz came in France uh, to uh, to have a surgery, and uh, I came in the 23 of March 1994. I never forget this day. Because I, I I I remember that I was you know uh, cooked uh, coup de pied dans le yeah kicked uh, from my country. I didn't want to leave my country, but I had to because I I needed to to sleep. I needed to leave. I needed to think again, and uh, then. Um, we we went uh, to France with a lot, lot, a lot of friends. You know, um, intellectuals and artists, and uh, part of them were killed in Algeria, and a big part of them uh, uh, went to uh, went exile. Uh, and I was uh, from uh, this part. Uh, we went there and we stay a uh, long time. And we continue still uh, to work. Uh, we had an organization which is Bled Connection, which is an association who uh, organize uh, concert. In 2003, uh, we decided with all uh, the connection, with all the artists we know, um, uh, to, um, to launch a campaign which was a successful campaign uh, about the discriminatory, uh, discriminatory family code in Algeria. It was a successful uh, campaign because the president uh, ordered to amend uh, a lot of discriminatory uh, laws. And uh, I want to show you this clip uh, because uh, uh, what saved my life, uh, it's a woman's right, it's continuing to, to work in this field. And thank you, Karima, for your uh, report. Really, thank you. We need it as tool, you know. Always, when we talk about fundamentalists, uh, people are, you know, could, uh, we we have a lot of uh, people who are uh, in um, uh, relativism. Uh, Cultural relativism. Yes, you know, they don't accept why we we live for them. So uh, why you do you, why do you accept why you don't want for you for the others? So, I just want to, to tell you that uh, this report is not something which is abstract, it's real life. Cultural right, it's real life. Every day we, 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 uh, we, we live with, uh, with culture, with music, with art, with theater, with, uh, with, uh, with books, with... Uh, so, um, I don't know. I, I should, <laughs> I must forget a lot of things, but I'm sorry for my English and uh, thank you. Ah, yes. Yes. Uh, yes, Aziz uh, didn't die, 
and the proof is that in 2003 he uh, produced, he uh, was the director of this, uh, this uh, very good clip. We cannot uh, watch all the clip, which is five minutes, but we can watch all the end. And this clip was very important with a lot of Algerian artists. It was in Arabic, in Berber, and in French uh, to be inclusive and to... Uh, um, and this is uh, the picture of the march of uh, the 90s when it was very dangerous to to demonstrate, but women were still uh, demonstrating and uh, a lot of Algerian uh, believed in democracy and fundamentalists uh, came and uh, they uh, broke uh, all what uh, we, we hoped at this period, but now it's better. <laughs> لازم نقطع الميدان لعدل ما يسواش كيغيب الميزان يا ناس الجزائر غطى والشمس بالغربال نحاجيكم يا بنات عشرين سنة بال des gazelles. Mineur ma soeur, alors on te rappelle. Écoutez la chanson, elle ne changera pas d'air. Et qu'on se le dise, cette loi est à défaire. À ne plus jamais faire, à ne plus jamais faire. Et qu'on se le dise, cette loi est à défaire. À ne plus jamais faire.
succinctly, I needed to sleep, to think, to live. And this is our real life. It's basic human rights. Um, and it, it, it's a, as simple as that, yeah? Um, uh, the next speaker is uh, Magnus Ag. Is, uh, is correct, yeah? Is from Free, Mu Free Muse, an international human rights organization defending the right to artistic freedom worldwide. Prior to joining Free Muse in 2015, Magnus was the Assistant Advocacy Director with the Committee to Protect Journalists in New York. For 20 years, Free Muse has been documenting attacks and defending artists around the world. Magnus. Thank you, Annie. Uh, around the world, artists and audiences are today celebrating Music Freedom Day, with events from Harare to Yangon, New York to Peshawar, Music Freedom Day is a global celebration, but also an opportunity to stand up and support artists that are being attacked, censored, or even killed for nothing more than their peaceful creative expressions. This year's focus is on women's rights to artistic freedom. I want to thank my fellow pa panelists for their inspiring presentations, and special thanks to uh, Karima for her timely and important report and the opportunity to speak here at the UN on this significant day for the artistic freedom community. Free Muse has been documenting attacks and defending artists at risk for 20 years. In 2016, <coughs> Free Muse documented a record 1,028 cases of censorship and attacks on art and artists in 78 countries around the world. We documented three killings two artists abducted, 16 attacked, 84 artists imprisoned, 43 prosecutions, 40 persecuted and persecutions and threats, and 840 acts of censorship. And if you divide those numbers by art form, you get the following picture. As you can see, film is the most targeted art form in 2016, with more than 600 cases. The reason, right, the number is this high, is in particular because of two blacklists issued that contain several hundred fil individual films that were banned. Music, however, is the wor worst hit art form when you exclude the censorship cases and only look at what we call serious violations such as killings, attacks, imprisonments. And this is not to say censorship is not serious. The violators behind these cases range from states to non-state actors but fundamentalism and extremism is often a motivating factor behind. One of Pakistan's most famous Qawwali singers, Amjad Sabri, was shot dead not far from, far from his home in Karachi in June last year. Two men, both mem members of anti-Shia militant groups, have since confessed to the killing the singer on sectarian grounds. In Iraq, in the city of Mosul, Islamic State militants publicly executed a 15-year-old boy in February last year simply for listening to so-called Western music. And in Germany, a man blew himself up outside an open-air music festival in the town of Anbach. Before detonating the explosive, he left the message pledging alliance to IS. The blast killed the man and injured 12 bystanders, three of them seriously. But deadly acts of terror are not the only way fundamentalists and extremists try to silence artists and their audiences. In Russia, non-state actors with nationalist agenda and ties to the Russian Orthodox Church continue to target the art. Krasnodar city authorities canceled the concerts of Austrian metal band Belfigor and American metal band Nile in April as they deemed the band members to be Satanists. The decision came after activists from so-called Orthodox Unity Group appealed to authorities to have the shows canceled. In Malaysia, a group of 20 NGOs filed reports against musician Namiwi's music video claiming it insulted Islam. This led to the police to detain the artist for four days, and the investigation is still ongoing. In India, right-wing activists from two different groups stormed the fourth annual Jaipur Art Summit, damaging paintings and attacked and injured an art, a painter. They also stole a painting in protest of it featuring Seminude, a seminude woman. Artists are targeted by fundamentalists and extremists because their creative expressions in themselves are seen as a threat, 
but also because artists play an important role in expressing alternative visions for society. This is nothing new. Fundamentalism and extremism has affected and damaged cultural expressions on several countries for hundred, continents for hundreds of years. Christian missionaries destroyed several cultural expressions during the times of colonialism. As the Special Rapporteur's report points out, women's cultural rights are especially under threat. At Free Muse, we see that when women artists are targeted, we see that when women artists are targeted, it's often specifically related to their gender. In some countries, women artists are even prohibited from performing solo or for mixed art audiences. Because it's more difficult for women to get on stage in the first place, it is also more difficult for us to document the restrictions women face. Next slide, please. In Nigeria, actress Rahama Sadu was expelled by her union for alleged, alleged immoral actions in a music video, video where she hugged, cuddled, and held hands with a male artist. Despite the fact that it takes two to hold hands, the male artist suffered no backlash for the video. And although music has slowly returned to Afghanistan after the all-out ban imposed by the Taliban, women's voices are still considered undesirable in many regions. In May last year, local Ministry of Information and Cultural Authorities in the southern Kandahar province banned women's songs from being broadcast across local media, directly affecting the 11 radio stations in operation in the area. Next slide, please. Oh yeah, got it. thanks. <laughs> But governments also use even harder means to silence alternative artistic voices. As we sit here in this room today, and as people are celebrating Music Freedom Day around the world, musician Mehdi Rajabian and his brother, filmmaker Hussein Rajabian, are behind bars in the Ven prison in Iran, serving a three-year sentence for insulting the sacred and propaganda against the state through the production and promoting promotion of music. Both have been on hunger strike twice to protest against the conditions they are held under, including the lack of medical attention. So as you can see, threats from fundamentalism and extremism against cultural rights and artistic freedom are many, and can be found in all corners of the world and across all major religions. It is the obligation of the state to protect and defend cultural rights from these threats, but equally important, Cultural rights and artistic freedom are a central part of the puzzle in, the, in combating fundamentalism and extremism. Therefore, Freemus would like to make the following five recommendations. One, states should respect, protect, and fulfill cultural rights, including the right to freedom of artistic expression and the right to take part in cultural life without discrimination. Two, states should ensure that non-state actors attacking the living arts are prosecuted and convicted according to international norms. Three, states should not abuse terror legislation to target artistic freedom of expression. Four, the international donor community should establish specific support programs for artists and cultural industries victimized by terror. This is a partic particularly urgent in Afghanistan, Mali, Iraq, Pakistan, Somalia, and Syria. And five, the international community should develop an early cultural warning system as cultural expressions are among the first targets of terrorism and fundamentalism. With the rise of populist and national leaders that are questioning the universality of human rights, now is the time to document violation and use those facts to defend and amplify threatened artistic voices. When governments and other in position of power forcefully try to secure a single dominant narrative, artists are at increased risk. Artistic expressions do not and should not fit into one frame. A healthy society needs alternative creative expressions. Thank you.